Hello there, and welcome to this collection of notebooks and tutorials on multi-rate signal processing. This is a course offered by Professor Schuller at the UMNL University of Technology. I am Renato, the instructor for these online materials, and on this notebook we will talk about the modified discrete cosine transform, the MDCT. So, let's get started. Last time we saw that paraunitary polyphase matrices are an easy way to obtain the inverse polyphase matrix for the synthesis. We just need to transpose the matrix and replace z by z to the power of minus 1. But how do we obtain useful paraunitary polyphase matrices or filter banks? More useful than a simple transform matrix. We now need to go one step further in increasing the length of our polynomials in the polyphase matrix. We saw that the zeroth order polynomials result in our usual transform matrices, like a DCT. But we already know their frequency response are often not good enough. The next step is to look at polynomials of first order, where we have elements of z to the power of minus 1. Then, this leads to impulse response with a length of two blocks. The first block corresponds to a delay of z to the power of 0, and the second block to the c to the power of minus 1. Hence, we get the impulse response length of L equals to 2n, with n the block length and the number of subbands. One widespread example are the so-called MDCT, the Modified Discrete Cosine Transform Future Banks, which are so-called cosine modulated future banks. As we saw in Lecture 6, modulation means the multiplication of a band's baseband prototype future impulse response with a periodic modulation function, here a cosine function. In this way, all the subband filters are obtained from one prototype future H of n, in this case uh, for the analysis future band, uh, filters uh, are given uh, here, this equation 1. And we have that the k goes from 0 to n minus 1, and here are the subbands, and the time index n goes from 0 to 2n minus 1, meaning we have future length uh, with length L equals to 2n. The prototype future, h of n, is a low-pass future, and the cosine function, the cosine modulation function that shifts the center frequency of the future, to the cosine function frequency, given by pi divided by kappa n times k plus 0 0.5, such that we evenly cover the entire frequency range from 0 to pi. Imagine the low pass having a pass band from a minus pi divided by 2 times kappa n to pi divided by 2 times kappa n, then the first subband or the subband for when k is equal to 0, already results from modulation with frequency pi divided by 2 times capital N, and hence it goes on the positive side from 0 to pi divided by n. In this way, we obtain n filter of passband width pi divided by capital N, which then cover the entire frequency range between 0 and pi in the positive frequency range. Again, the negative frequencies are the mirrored version. Observe that we can view in equation 1, again here, the multiplication of h of n with the cosine term also as a window design method. Yeah? So we can see this multiplication like we've seen before with the window design method. Here, the ideal filter would not be a sync function, but an infinitely long cosine function. This corresponds to infinitely narrow bandpass filters at the cosine frequencies as ideal filters. After windowing, they then become wider. Because of these two different views, we see two different names in literature for this H of n. It could be a baseband prototype, but we also see as a window function, it's a time-reversed uh, baseband prototype. Let's take a look now in a Python example for such filters. Let's take the so-called sine window or baseband prototype for n equals to 8 subbands. Once again, we are importing our Python libraries. We are using NumPy, PyPlot, and SciPy signal. 
Here we are defining the block size, so the number of subbands. Here we are defining the length of the filter. And here we are calculating the number of blocks in the filter. Here we have the sign window impulse response. So this is the sign window. And here we are plotting the frequency um, response for the filters. So we have K from 0 to 8. And we have this uh, 0 to 7. So we have this uh, 8 subbands, which is the same number of the block size. So you see here the K goes from 0 to N and N goes uh, from 0 to L and L is the length of the filter. In this case it's 2 times the block size or the number of subbands. And here we have the MDCT analysis filter bank uh, frequency response so it's given in this plot. We see that H is indeed a low-pass filter. It works as both a window and a low-pass prototype filter. We see that our low-pass filter H is indeed shifted in frequency, H and of K, to become a band-pass filters and a high-pass filter. So we have the low-pass, then we shift, and we have these band passes, and the last one is a high-pass filter. So the baseband prototype of window H of N is what we need for the design of our filter bank. H of N is a low pass, which we want to design now with the goal that we get high stop band attenuation and also obtain perfect reconstruction. For the synthesis filters, we have the baseband prototype filter G of N, which produces the subband filters given by G of K of N with K is our subbands. How do we now design the prototype filters H of N and G of N such that we obtain perfect reconstruction? At this point, it's, it is not even clear if it works with this modulation constraint we just introduced. To see that, we first con construct the polyphase matrices. Here is the analysis polyphase matrix and we get its elements given by these equations here. Observe the upper limit of our summation index is L divided by capital N minus 1, and here it's equal to 1 because we have L equals to 2N. So we have two blocks, block 0 and block 1. This means we only have two summons for M equals to 0 and M equals to 1. For the synthesis polyphase matrix, we get these equations here. And in this way, we obtain the analysis polyphase matrix given here. So here we have the H of MDCT, and we have all these elements of our analysis polyphase matrices. And here we see that we have our um, only polynomials of the first order as elements of our a matrix. We have z to the power of 0 and we have z to the power of minus 1. The, um, the synthesis polyphase matrix is something similar and we have here this synthesis polyphase matrix. So observe the corresponding time phase indices for the analysis and synthesis polyphase matrix which run the transpose way for the synthesis. Here we have H0 and N, which is here, 0 and N. Here we have um, N minus 1 and 2 N minus 1 N, and we have N minus 1, 2 N minus 1 N, and so on and so forth. The problem is that we still don't know how to proceed with the design of our prototype filters. We basically could start constructing an analysis polyphase matrix and then invert it to obtain perfect reconstruction. But the inverse of a polynomial matrix is not easy to compute, and also the inverse polyphase matrix might have filters which are not good. For, for in, uh, instance, no real pass band or no, not sufficient stop band attenuation, or we could get um, IIR filters instead of FIR filters. But here we can apply a trick that will help. Since we have a modulated filter bank, 
we have certain periodicities hidden in the impulse response and hence in the polyphase methods. It is possible to investigate those periodicities manually and come up with a solution for perfect reconstruction. As Princeton and Bradley did in the late 80s, who first described the MDCT, which they called the TD TDAC then, was the time domain alias in constellation, because that was the approach that they used. They analyzed all the alias and components in the time domain and found one condition to cancel them in the time domain. And this leads to the sign window. And later, people, uh, especially in the MPEG context, called it the MDCT. Here we will investigate the symmetries of a longer cosine modulation function using a Python example. So let's take a modulated analysis feature bank uh, with impulse responses given by this equation. Here, with a cosine modulation function, it's like a DCT4. Then for subband k equals to 0, for n equals to 8 subbands, and for a length of 32, we get this plot here. And we see the symmetries. So we have blocks of 8 samples. This is the block 0. And then we see the block 1 is equal to the block, the block 0, but with inverted sign and flipped from left to right. Then block 2, it will be equal to block 0, but with an inverted sign. And finally, block 3 is just the flipped version from left to right of block 0. So this image visualizes the following symmetry. We have that the second block is identical to flipping and negating the first block. We can see just uh, by the numbers, so the same which is described by this picture. Uh, the third, the second block is identical to flipping and ne negating the first block. The third block is identical to negating the first block. And the last block is identical to flipping the first block. And here is the proof of how we are doing. And so on. So we see the following rule. Every second block is flipped. And after two blocks, we get a sign change. This is not only true for the first subband, but also for all other subbands K. To show this, uh, how this is useful for a matrix implementation, let's take the following example. We have a prototype function H of n, and we have n is equal to four subbands. Then our modulated impulse response for subband K equals to zero with the basic DCT4 cosine modulation function is given here. And to show that the basic principle, the time shift of the um, MDCT was omitted. Now we can implement it with a block size of 4 for a filter length of 8, twice as long as the DCT4. We have two modulated blocks with block number 0 and 1 with the time reversal for the analysis, so for H0. So we have here H0, block 0 and block 1, and we have here these elements. You can see there is a time reversal for the analysis for H0. Now we can write the modulation with the length 2 times n with our cosine function with the help of a matrix formulation which includes the flipping and the sign change of the second cosine modulation block. For that, we also define the first block of our cosine modulation function given here. Observe that the T0 transposed is also the first column of our DCT4 matrix. Hence, for the first block of the modulated impulse response, we simply get this here. You can see it's diagonal here. And because of the modulation block, block one, um, is time flipped and sign changed compared to the first block, block zero, we obtain our second modulated block as um, given here. So instead of flipping and changing the sign of our modulation vector Tz, we apply the flipping and sign change to the matrix of the prototype function. And we have now this diagonal here 
you can see we have this sign changes here and then we have this equation and hence we can put both together in the z domain it's given here so we have our first block z to the power of zero we have a, a second block z to the power of minus one and this is what we get here and observe that we can simply add the two previous matrices since they have the same size and we can factor out um, the vector of the modulation function t of zero and multiply the second block with z to the power of minus one to obtain the z transform. So this is what we're doing here. We have this matrix. We're adding this matrix to this one. And this is the result. And we can also um, factor out the vector of the modulation t of zero. And we are multiplying the second block with z to the power of minus one. And then we have our z transform. We see that we obtain a very compact representation for the modulation where we separated the prototype function and the modulation function into two different matrices and the matrix with the prototype function is a sparse matrix. If uh, we extend this example to filters of length of um, four blocks, we would get this cross-shaped matrix. Observe that every polynomial in this resulting matrix is downsampled version of the prototype uh, H of n by a factor of 2 times capital N. In our case, 2 times capital N is equal to 8. In addition, every second resulting value after this downsampling is also sign change. We can also obtain the sign change by replacing z to the power of 2 by minus z to the power of 2 in the z transform for the 2 times capital N downsampled version. So this matrix times our column vector T0 transpose above results in the polyphase representation of our subn filter H0 N for the subn K equals to 0. So this is the first of the four filters we have in our modulated filter bank. We obtain all four filters if we just use the complete DCT4 transform matrix T given here. So for instance, with n equals to 4, we get for T these values here using this Python function. We are just implementing this in Python. Fortunately, we obtain the same symmetries for the first sub n also for the higher subbands. In summary, we have an analysis filter bank with the impulse response given here. And its analysis polyphase matrix H of C can be written as a multiplication of a sparse cross-shaped matrix with a DCT4 transform matrix T given here. And notice that for odd numbers of subbands n, we would obtain one value or one polynomial in the center of the matrix. We will now go deeper into this investigation of sparse matrices and the MDCT. So let's remember that the MDCT analysis impulse responses are given by this equation 2b here and that the filter length here is limited to 2 times capital N, meaning that uh, small n goes from 0 to 2 times capital N minus 1. And since the MDCT has a very similar modulation function as the DCT4, we just have this uh, time shift of n capital N divided by 2 in it, we suspect that we can also factor it into a sparse matrix and the DCT transform matrix like here. Here, there is some uh, sparse matrix FA of Z. If this assumption is true, we can obtain the sparse matrix by bringing the transform matrix from the above form, uh, formula to the other side of the equation. And we would have that the sparse matrix is given by the H MDCT Z times T to the power of minus 1. We can simply start with uh, construct, constructing the complete polyphase matrix 
HMDCT using equations 1 and 2 that we've seen before. So here we have equation 1, here we have equation 2. And then if we plug in to this equation 2b, we can compute FA of z as follows, resulting in this equation 3. This is for the simple case of a filter length of just 2 times capital N, which is the length of a MDCT. For odd numbers of subbands N, we will get one value or one polynomial in the top and bottom row centers and the left and right most columns. Observe that we now have all the lays on the left side of the matrix, uh, which allows us to factor them out. So we just see the delays on the left um, side and side of the matrix, and there are no delays here. Once again, let's use Python to take a look at what we've seen. So we can try out this factorization, for instance, if we use the SymPy, the symbolic uh, mathematics package, and uh, observe that the exponentiation in Python is symbolized with uh, two stars. So here, from SymPy, we're importing all, and from SciPy, we're also importing everything. Here, we are defining z as a symbol. We define n equals to 4. And we are having a baseband prototype, which is from H0 to H7 as symbols. So the MDCT uh, polyphase matrix H, we are doing this here. Uh, since each column contains the time reversed impulse response, we need n minus 1 minus n instead of n. And we will start with uh, n by n. Uh, matrix of zeros. So what we're doing, we're having a matrix of zeros n by n, and then we are going from n going to 0 to n, and k also going from 0 to n, and here we have our n minus 1 minus n, and this will give all the elements for our uh, matrix, and this is the equation we see before. Here we have our z to the power of minus 1, and here we would have our z to the power of 0. So then the transform matrix T for the DCT4 is given here. And now our sparse matrix FA is the H, which we computed here, times T here the power of minus 1. And then we will print uh, this matrix and this is what we have. This is our matrix H and this is our mm, sparse matrix uh, FA. Here we see that it's the same as equation 3 apart from some rounding errors and that we get a diamond matrix shape. This diamond shape results from the time shift of n capital N divided by 2 in the cosine modulation function. It has the effect of shifting the left and the right halves of the above cross shaped matrix and multiplying it with z to the power of minus 1. The result of shifting or exchanging this, those two halves in this diamond shaped matrix uh, that we can see here. This matrix is now surprisingly simple. It only contains the two types capital N samples of our baseband prototype impulse responses. Most entries are zero, and we have delays of c to the power of minus one only on the left side. So we have z to the power of minus one here on the left side. And this was the purpose of the sum in capital N divided by two on the cosine modulation function. In this way, we can factor out the delays using a, what we will call a delay matrix, which is uh, very important for invertibility and perfect reconstruction. The particular diamond shape of the matrix results from the symmetries of the cosine modulation and the shift of capital N divided by 2 on the modulation function for the time index. As we said before, we can factor out the delays 
using this, what we are calling the delayed metric, even here. So if um, for faster implementation, so we are not going to use symbolic mathematics, we are not going to use SymPy, and we can again rewrite this matrix here as a polynomial with matrix coefficients. So we have this delay matrix, see, so here we have the terms of z to the power of zero plus this matrix z to the power of minus one, and we store this matrix coefficients in a three-dimensional tensor. So we will store these matrix coefficients on a three-dimensional tensor. So one tensor for z to the power of zero and one for z to the power of minus one. We can factor out this delay matrix and what remains is a matrix which only contains the coefficients of our baseband prototype filter, which we'll call the folding matrix or the filter matrix FA. So is given here by equation four. And so we get the FA of Z is equals to FA times D of Z. So we have this is the FA, this is the D of Z, and when we multiply them, we get this FA of Z. Once again, we see this theory into practice using Python, first with SymPy, symbolic mathematics, and then a faster implementation, not using SymPy, here. So we are defining this uh, FA matrix, then we are defining our delay matrix, and then when we multiply FA, times d, and we get the following results. Now, there's a faster numerical Python implementation, but we will use the function polmat uh, mode that we've seen last time. Uh, it's, um, just multiply two polynomial matrices, array and b, uh, which each matrix entry is a polynomial, and those polynomials entries are in the third dimension. So the third dimension can also be interpreted as containing the 2D coefficient matrix of exponent z to the power of minus 1, as we've seen before. So now we are defining n equals to 4. Here we have our FA matrix. Here we have our delay matrix as a three-dimensional tensor, one for z to the power of 0, one for z to the power of minus 1. Then we will multiply this um, polyphase matrices, this polynomial matrices using this function. So we see now we have FA and we have D with these two components and here we have their product and if we see it's the same like we've seen it's like one so um, 4, 3, minus 2, minus 1, and we have here 4, 3, minus 2, minus 1, without delays. And here we have 1, 2, 3, 4, with the delays. And we have 1, z to the power of minus 1, 2, z to the power of minus 1, 3 and 4, and we have the same results. We see that the first matrix is the coefficients matrix for z to the power of z um, z to the power of zero and the second is the coefficient for matrix z to the power of minus one so z to the power of zero z to the power of minus one and we see that this result is identical to the calculation using symbolic mathematics we can also use python to implement a function for fa matrix which generates the folding matrix fa from a general coefficient array H. So here we define this FA matrix function that will produce a diamond shaped folding matrix FA from the coefficients H, where H is a row matrix. And we see that this indeed has this diamond shape like we've seen in equation 4. So here we are defining the function, we are using this um, sign chains and we're using this uh, flipping uh, left to right and then we have here an H array and then the resulting FA matrix using this formula. We can move now to the factorization 
And we have now an easy way to write or construct our analysis polyphase matrix. And we have that HD MDCT of Z is equal to the FA times this delay matrix times this T. And we observe that these three matrices are now much simpler and also much more efficiently implementable. FA only contains real or complex numbers and it's uh, a sparse matrix which can be efficiently implemented. And also D of C, we have only the delays, and T, the DCT4 transform, can also be efficiently implemented, for instance, using our DCT4 function uh, from lecture 2, uh, which we uh, apply to each block. For the synthesis polyphase matrix, we get the GM DCT, T to the power of minus 1, then we have this FS of C, and this is equal to t to the power of minus 1 times fs times z to the power of minus 1. And we can apply the same trick now with the synthesis polyphase matrix. We assume that we um, can also write it as a sparse matrix fs. And now with the inverse transform matrix in the beginning to invert the analysis transform matrix solving for the sparse matrix fs of z. And this yields T times GM DCTZ is equal to FS of Z, and this results in this matrix here. And we can also use Python to obtain. So, what we are doing again, we have, uh, we will use SymPy, so we are importing SymPy, we are defining uh, Z as a symbol. We define n equals to 4. Here we are doing our baseband prototype filters, uh, the symbols. Here we have the uh, polyphase matrix G. Uh, each column contains the inputs response. Here we have our transform matrix T, the same principles that we use for the analysis. Now we are using for the synthesis. And we can compute the sparse matrix, so it will be T times G. And here we have, again, this diamond shape, but now with a different ordering of the coefficients of the baseband prototype G of n. So the time or phase coefficient n of our baseband prototype G of n runs from left to right, which also corresponds to transposing of matrices. And observe that here the delays are on the lower half of our matrix. We can again factor out these delays with a matrix which we multiply from the left hand side in which has the delay on the lower half of its diagonal. We can again write this needed uh, matrix using our just defined matrix DZ by using its inverse. Remember that the inverse of a diagonal matrix is obtained by inverting each element of its diagonal separately. So this is an example how to inverse a diagonal matrix. And therefore we get this delay, inverse of this delay given here. This means that we replace z to the power of minus 1 by z in the delay matrix. But this would result in a non-causal system. So z denotes the future block. To make it causal and also to obtain the delays on the lower half of the diagonal, we need to multiply the inverse matrix by z to the power of minus 1. So we are multiplying this inverse matrix by z to the power of minus 1. So this now has the delays z to the power of minus 1 on the lower part of its diagonal as needed. So what we did is to make it this delay matrix um, to make it uh, causal and also to obtain the delays on the lower half of the diagonal, we multiply the inverse matrix by z to the power of minus 1. And using this result, we obtain the synthesis folding matrix Fs that's given by this matrix 5. In this way, we can rewrite the synthesis polyphase matrix as GMDCT of C equals to T minus. 1 times z
Using this result, we obtain the synthesis folding matrix FS, given here by this matrix 5. And we, this way, we can rewrite the synthesis polyphase matrix as the GMDCT of C equals to T to the power of minus 1 times Z to the power of minus 1 times D to the power of minus 1 of C times FS. We move on to see how to obtain perfect reconstruction. The direct concatenation of the analysis and synthesis filter banks without any processing in between leads to the product of their polyphase matrices. So it's H M D C T of C times G M D C T of C. And when we replace, we will have this final result. So we have this F A times Z to the power of minus one times F S. And the product of this um, their polyphase matrix should result in a pure delay. Remember, our polyphase representation is in the downsample domain, since all polyphase elements are downsampled sequences at different phase. Hence, a multiplication with z to the power of minus one corresponds to a delay of one sample in the downsample domain, which corresponds to a delay of one block in our original signal domain. This is a very important thing to have in mind. So again. Um, a multiplication with z to the power of minus 1 corresponds to a delay of one sample in the downsample domain, which corresponds to a delay of one block in our original signal domain. The pure delay is the case if we choose that fs is equal to fa to the power of minus 1. Then we can compare this result with the equation 5 to obtain the synthesis prototype function g of n to obtain perfect reconstruction. Once more, we use Python to investigate these results. So we will assume we have a block, a length, and a number of subbands uh, n equal to 4. And our baseband prototype impulse response h of n is given by this array here. And we use equation 4 and we get the analysis folding matrix fa. And here is the analysis for the matrix FA, and then we get its inverse. So observe that usually this folding matrix is invertible because of its special shape resulting from the time shift of capital N divided by 2 in the cosine modulation function. And then this inverse becomes the folding matrix for the synthesis to ensure the perfect reconstruction. So we have here this inverse. And this is now equal to the synthesis folding matrix Fs. And when we compare it with the equation 5, we can read out the resulting synthesis baseband impulse response given here. And we can see that its values, they are not identical to the analysis prototype H of n. The numerator is the same, but the denominators change. To find out more about inverse in an, anal in an analytical way, the matrices FA and FS in equations 4 and 5 can be treated as nested 2 by 2 submatrices. We take the second non-zero entries of a given row N and the corresponding non-zero entries of the mirrored row N minus 1 minus N and these four non-zero entries become our submatrix. So these submatrices have the following form. Because they are nested into each other, they don't interact with the other 2 by 2 submatrices in the multiplication. Hence, we only need to consider 2 by 2 matrices at position n. And here n goes from 0 to n, capital N divided by 2, minus 1, such that we obtain capital N divided by 2 submatrices. So, for instance, the submatrix for n equals to 0 would contain the elements of FA of the first row and the last row. For bigger n, the submatrices contain the non-zero elements of the corresponding rows in between for n equals to 1, the second row, and the row 1 before the last row. In this way, we reduced our bigger matrix into several smaller simple matrices. 
And the inverse of the submatrices is easily obtained in closed form. And we have here. Observe that the, den the denominator is the negative determin determinant of the submatrix. And the corresponding submatrices for the synthesis are given here. And by setting them equal, we get a solution for perfect reconstruction. So we have the submatrix for synthesis equal to this one, what we calculated here, and this would be the solution for the perfect reconstruction. Here we can see that if we choose the determinant to be minus 1, the denominator to be 1, then we get the identical analysis and synthesis prototype filters up to the sign and not necessarily para-unitary polyphase matrices. If we choose the determinant equals to minus 1, then the comparison of the submatrices shows that g of n is equal to minus h of n for n going from 0 to 2 capital N minus 1. And this means that the analysis and the synthesis window must be identical if the determinant is equal to minus 1 for perfect reconstruction. This must be true for every submatrix. So in conclusion, if we design our window h of n such that the determinant is equal to minus 1, then would, we would automatically obtain perfect reconstruction if we choose g of n is equal to minus h of n. We've seen that if we design our window h of n such that the determinant is equal to minus 1, then we would automatically obtain perfect reconstruction if we choose g of n equals to minus h of n. So observe that this is a very powerful result. It tells us how to obtain perfect reconstruction, including the cancellation of all alias components, even though we didn't even look at them. But it comes up a question. Is this now also an orthogonal, or rather a para-unitary matrix? So let's see. For a para-unitary polyphase matrix H of C, meaning H to the power of minus 1 of C is equal to H transpose of C minus 1, we already have an orthogonal matrix T, which in this case of real valued matrix also means uh, orthogonality. So T to the power of minus 1 is equal to T, T transposed. Hence T is also para-unitary. For real or complex valued matrix, orthogonality and para-unitary is the same. Now, we check the delay matrix. For DZ, the transpose is identical to the original since it's a diagonal matrix. Remember, we have the DZ, the delay, the, the delay matrix, even here, and we have this diagonal. And if we replace Z by Z to the power of minus 1, and then we take the transpose, and we will get D of C here. And if we multiply those two matrices, we will get the identity. This means that also the delay matrix is para-unitary. Now we must check the folding matrix. If we now design a FA such that it's um, orthonormal, so with FA to the power of minus 1 is equal to FA transpose, then the entire polyphase matrix, well, it's made of this multiplication of the folding matrix times the delay matrix times the T matrix, will become para-unitary, yes, using this property here. So here we have the H transpose of C to the power of minus 1 is equal to the F8 times the delay matrix C to the power of minus 1 times T transposed, and we'll have this result here. Since our transform matrix and folding matrix are orthonormal, we have the T, T transpose is equal to the inverse of T, T to the power of minus 1, and the FA transpose is equal to the FA inverse, the FA to the power of minus 1, we see that our analysis poly polyphase matrix is indeed peri-unitary. And we have that the H that the transpose of C to the power of minus 1 is equal to inverse of H in C. This means that if we ensure that every matrix of our product is para-unitary, the product is also para-unitary.
So what does this mean for analysis, uh, for our analysis folding matrix FA? We know now that in our special case of a orthonormal folding matrix, we have the property that the inverse of FA is equal to FA transposed, which we can also apply to our submatrices. And how do we get our matrix FA orthonormal? Well, we take our general inverse and set it equal to the transposed matrix. And that's what we are doing here. Now, when we assume that we have the determinant uh, equals to minus 1, then we will have this result here. And we can see that the left side is the result of the inversion and the right hand side is the result of transposing. So looking at the two matrices with n going from 0 to n capital N minus 1, we see that h of n is equal to h of 2, capital, two times capital N minus 1 minus uh, n. And this means that we have a symmetric window, symmetric around its center. So it looks the same forward and backwards. If uh, this is the case, then also the FA is para-unitary. To summarize, if we have the determinant of our 2 by 2 submatrices to be equal to minus 1 as part of the design process, then the baseband impulse responses for analysis and synthesis they are identical with this sign so h of n is equal minus g of n if we also would like to have orthogonality or para unitarity we need symmetric baseband impulse response and we have f h of n is equal to minus g of n and h of n is equal to h of the two times capital n minus one minus n and these are two important properties which we obtain for our baseband impulse responses. A simple example for this case, where the determinant is equal to minus 1 and orthogonality, is the sine window. And the sine window is given here. This case also leads to para-unitary polyphase matrices because it is a symmetric window, symmetric around its center. The sine window is often used in the MDCT future bank because it's easy to design. We know it leads to perfect reconstruction and still has a reasonable frequency response. For instance, the raised cosine window would even have a better frequency response, but it would not lead to perfect reconstruction if it's also used for the synthesis. So it does not fulfill the condition that the determinant should be equal to minus 1. For perfect reconstruction, we need to compute a different synthesis prototype. So, para-unitarity is good for, a, for an easy design for perfect reconstruction. So, remark that for para-unitary polyphase matrices, Parseval's theorem for the energy conservation still holds, so in the limit of long sequences, meaning that the total energy in the signal in the time domain is equal to the total energy in all subbands. This can be used, for example, for the estimation of the energy of the quantization error in the reconstructed signal, or the total energy of quantization error in the subbands is equal to the energy of the quantization error in the reconstructed signal. This is important, for instance, for design quantizers. Observe that we don't necessarily need the symmetry of our baseband impulse response. If we only have the, the, the determinant condition that the determinant is equal to minus 1, we still have h of n is equal to minus g of n, but they don't need to be symmetric. In this case, Parseval's theorem does not need to hold, but it can still hold approximately. Observe the factor of c to the power of minus 1, which we obtained in the inversion of the delay matrix D of Z to obtain causal filters. This means we get a delay of one block and it is the source of the algorithm or the system delay and of our analysis and synthesis filter bank. If the synthesis follows directly after the analysis filter bank. In general, the system delay is the blocking delay of n minus one samples to assemble the signal into blocks of length n, plus the delay needed to make our matrices causal. This is a very important 
result is telling us that the system delay is equal to the blocking delay of n minus 1 samples it's necessary to assemble the signal into blocks of length n plus the delay needed to make our matrices causal in the case of the mdct we get a block delay of uh, n minus 1 plus the delay from our delay matrix which results in a total delay of 2 times capital n minus 1 samples in the mdct case our filter length is L equals to 2 times N, hence our total or our system delay can also be written as ND equals to L, yeah, the filter length, minus 1. We see that the delay is coupled to the filter length. This is true in general for orthogonal or para-unitary filter banks, and also for longer filters we obtain uh, ND is equal to L minus 1. This is one of the drawbacks of orthogonal uh, filter banks. To obtain lower delay, we need to take non-orthogonal or non-para-unitary matrices. So, non-para-unitary matrices or filter banks can have some important advantages, but they are more difficult to design. We are reaching the end of this tutorial, and now we are going to take a look at the Python implementation of the MDCT, first the analysis and later the synthesis. In this example, we are going to use an audio file from this band from Brazil called Double Cross. You can check them out in Spotify and in Instagram. Oh, here you can click and check them out. We are going to use a song from their first EP. It's called uh, the song is called Paganizer. Oh, that's great stuff they are very kind to let me use their audio in this uh, tutorial so you should check them out if you like the sound and here so we are using um, Librosa to import this um, mp3 file and we're just printing here the number of samples now we are defining the number of subbands and we use 1024 subbands here is the sign window for the MDCT and here we're just plotting the sign window so next, we are calculating the folding matrix using this FA matrix that we've seen before. And here is the window. We are also having here the delay matrix T of Z. And then we are multiplying the FA matrix by this delay matrix and we have this FA of C. So now we are converting the input signal X, which is the audio samples from the Paganizer song from Double Cross and we are converting this into a polyphase row vector for blocks of length n. And we see that we will have 8822 blocks. So then we are multiplying this um, polyphase vector by this FAZ polyphase matrix and we have this y of p. So well, here we have uh, L is the number of blocks that we calculated here. Here we are having the DCT4 and then we are applying the DCT4 transform to the rows of this uh, y of p that we have here. And then here's the resulting spectrogram image of this process. Here's the Y of P. And you observe that we have the highest frequencies uh, at that, that the small subband in this escape. And we have only 8,822 blocks. So we are dividing this number here by 1,024. This gives us the number of blocks. And this is the MDCT for the analysis. From the critically sampled version, we can go back to the original time domain using the synthesis MDCT. So this is what we're looking at. This is the MDCT synthesis filter bank. And we want to achieve the perfect reconstruction. So what we are doing now is we are computing the inverse folding matrix for the synthesis, Fs. And we are doing 
here, then we are applying the inverse transform for which the DCT4 is identical to the forward transform. We are applying the DCT4 inverse transform to the rows here. Then we are calculating the inverse delay matrix with delay, which is here. Then we're multiplying the inverse delay matrix with delay. And we have this pole map mode that we seen before. And then we are multiplying the synthesis folding matrix Fs with the YOP, and then we have the X reconstructed P. So here it's a polyphase signal, and we are going to use polyphase to X to convert the polyphase input signal into a contiguous row vector. So this is what we are doing now. We have this X rec P, and we are applying this polyphase to X now. Before we had an X rec P with these dimensions. And then we convert from polyphase to X. We have this here. And here we can plot the original, which is in blue, and the reconstructed, which is in orange. And uh, we see that there is a delay of 1024 samples. So if I introduce this 1024 samples, we have perfect reconstruction with this delay of 1024 samples between the original and the reconstruct signal, which is the system delay without the blocking delay, since the signal is already in memory. That's it for our tutorial. I hope uh, it was useful. And don't forget to check out the sound, this double cross, and I hope to use much more of um, their songs in the um, next tutorials.